Ashley, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, I'm gonna, I am Casey Solari Williams. I should tell you who I am. I'm the president <laughs> of the American School Health Association. And we are so excited uh, to welcome you all to the webinar uh, today. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen so that we can uh, really just talk to the talk to the moment. Um, and it is just that. Seeing my screen, everything looking fine. The water's just fine, right? All right. So we're talking today and looking at getting help for mental health, free tools and resources for our students and our staff. And we are excited to have two amazing presenters um, with us today. And I'm excited to be partnering uh, with uh, an ASHA member, but in her in her capacity um, as a president of the society. So I'll talk about Rosemary here in just a minute, uh, but I'm excited uh, for, for everything that you all uh, see presented up here. Um, just to, if for those of you who don't know, uh, Asha, if this is one of your first uh, moments to be just a part of us and, and around us, the mission of the American School Health Association is to transform all schools into places where every student learns and thrives. And so the American School, American School Health Association envisions healthy students who learn and achieve in safe and healthy environments, nurtured by caring adults, functioning with coordinated school and community support systems. So that is who we're all about. And we also love that we have um, some great partners uh, just around the nation um, and, and, and doing different things. And uh, to our members, we have benefits that are we love to share um, in addition to these partnerships, right? And so we also have our Journal of School Health, um, which is a, our great research and publication journal. And we have some things for practitioners coming through. We have special issues on topics that are, are much relevance every single day and we wanted to definitely highlight uh, those so please uh, if you're already a member you know you you know you are able to access this but for those who are not we have opportunities for free access on certain things and special some of our special issues and, and then of course if you have a subscription with your organization we thank you for supporting Josh and and, and checking out that wonderful information you are participating in our continuing education opportunity right now this is something we offer to our members um, at no cost it's part comes with your membership um, and so anytime that there's a webinar you are able to get continuing education credits or units uh, for those and um, we have specific specifically ones that are specific organizations that we're partnered with already that, you know, you can definitely get those C's or CEUs, and then you can petition to your, your credentialing agency if we're not already an official partner, because uh, what you're getting, I mean, definitely shared with your profession. That is exactly why we do what we do. Uh, we want this out there so that all of our students can learn and thrive. And then also uh, being a member of Get your discounts with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the publications. Um, we also have a connection with the Sex Ed Network. Um, and then we post in our career center things about different job postings. So that's definitely great for our students. And I'm an advocate for student success because in addition to my role as president of ASHA, I am also a clinical assistant faculty member at professor at the University of Houston. So student success is, is high on my uh, priority list. So I love this career center opportunity for our students, but of course, for our existing professionals too. And then of course, just being able to connect with each other and that information and expertise that our, um, not just our resources provide, but just the human resources, not you know not the tangible reading resources or video re electronic resources, but the human resources that we can connect you to. And we are excited about being uh, an, an association that does that and we thrive, we thrive on that so that our students can in turn thrive as a result. And so, um, Join our newsletter, you know, uh, listserv and stay connected in that way. Um, but, you know, follow us on social media, all those different things. We love it. Visit our website. Just stay connected. Provide those resources. Let us know of other resources that you would love to see available. We want to, we definitely want to meet the needs and meet people uh, where they are. And that is what, again, uh, brings us to today and makes me think about, again, those partnerships and partnerships. Partnering. And what we've done today is partnering with this. We've partnered with the Society of State Leaders and of Health and Physical Education 
and representing the society, as you'll just hear. I called, like I mentioned when we first got started, the society's president, Rosemary Riley Shamat, is with us today. And we have been... <laughs> working through how we're going to partner and do some things. We do things at our conference, you know, uh, remember when in-person conferences happened? Oh, can we do it again, right? But we, you know, we would partner uh, with the society every year and, and has been a wonderful relationship, but we are excited to take it to the next level and right, go beyond just our conferences for the two organizations and come together with you all with this webinar and on such a wonderful topic. So Rosemary, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Casey, for all of your, your energy and enthusiasm. Um, and it is really my honor to be here today representing the Society of State Leaders of Health and Physical Education. The society was founded in 1926, so we're 95 years old, and it's a national organization comprised of individuals employed in state and territorial departments of education who have expertise in health education, physical education, and related areas. And we are so excited to continue and expand our partnership with the American School Health Association to co-present this webinar on mental health. The pandemic has exacerbated inequities that we already knew existed across the nation and as evidenced by the overwhelming response to this professional development experience, mental health is a top concern across the lifespan and most notably for our children. While there is light at the end of the tunnel from a disease prevention perspective and control perspective, the mental health impact related to this trauma will continue. So welcome, we're so happy that you're here and I'm going to turn it back to Caitlin. So Caitlin's going to put up a poll because we kind of want to know who's in the room, right? Who is it? our speakers want to know, you know, be able to read the room and see who it is that they're speaking to. So if you will please complete the poll and submit your response um, for your professional discipline. Um, someone asked in the chat, um, when would they be able to access this just in case they have to step out to run and get the kids? We'll have this recording. You'll get an announcement. It'll be sent to you when you can access the recording. Um, we will have great resources, just a little, you know, a little spoiler alert, um, if you will, that we have great resources that our uh, speakers will be providing to you as well as access to the slide information. So all of this information, um, yes, we're, we're glad you're here now, but if you need it later, you'll be able to access it. All right. Kaylin, you just let me know when you're ready to give the 10 second warning for folks who, or if we have a good percentage of response rate, all that good stuff. We are at 85% almost. Mm. So just my class, I like, yeah, class, I like to get to 90%. I, yeah, I usually wait for like at least 90% of people. You know, sometimes folks are in places where they can't respond or they're, you know, um, driving, please be safe. And let's not, we do not text and drive. So, um, so please, if that is what you're doing and you're just listening in, um, we understand that. So if we can hit that 90% mark, that would be awesome. Hello, Bloomington and Bentonville, excuse me. I cannot say, a kick, a kick. I don't know how to say that. Hello and welcome St. Louis. All right, we're hovering at 89%, so. Come on, y'all can do it, y'all can do it. <laughs> Get us over the hub. Also, we're going to be monitoring the chat. As you can see, I'm saying hello to some of the folks from like from Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Buenos dias uh, from New Mexico. And um, Brian, right, Casey. Minnesota. Hello. We got there? 90. 90. And my capital just, that was perfect timing. Someone from my capital, my state capital, just uh, said hello. Um, and that perfect timing. So we're going to go ahead and close that poll out and see who's, see who's in the room. Can y'all see? I don't see them anymore. All right, we've got it. We're rocking. There we oh, go. There it, there is. it is. I was like, I know, I know we can see it. Awesome. Got the school nurses coming through strong. Love it. 
we've got admins in here and I just, I'm like, this is awesome. We are, this is what it should look like. So now y'all, yeah, I'm going to try to get us on to, onto our task, but this is what I'm talking about. Just someone from all over these different disciplines. These are, you all should be at the table with each other all the time. And so I love that this is the space and place that you've, you've been able to do so. So we can hear from the perspectives of all of you working with our students in the communities and, and, and parents and all and, and each other, right? So this is exciting. I'm really excited about this. Keep things coming in the chat. If you have questions as our presenters are presenting, we'll be capturing those, we'll be coming back to those. There's dedicated times for you to ask questions um, so if it doesn't get asked right then, or if it's something that's really pressing, you know, you know, please ask now. Um, our presenters have, you know, been very gracious in saying, please feel free to stop me if there's a question that is pressing that must be answered right then. We absolutely will do so. But just also know that we have dedicated time. But if you don't want to forget your question, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll have it ready and geared up when the Q&A session comes after our first presenter. And then we'll have a dedicated time after our second presenter. And then if you think of something for our first presenter, and you didn't get a chance to ask it, don't worry. We have time at the end that's dedicated for like a panel style kind of discussion uh, between both the presenters, uh, Rosemary and myself, and, and we'll we'll take those at the very end. And then we'll talk some housekeeping at the end, just on how you get your, you know, your credits and what to do, you know, post webinar. We'll talk about that at the end as well. So we, we've got a good thing lined up for y'all. I'm excited to get going. So let's do just that. Okay, great. Yeah, we have the whole school, whole community, whole child framework going on right here at this webinar, right? Makes me happy. So, <laughs> very happy. So I'm really very um, delighted that I am able to introduce our two presenters. Um, first, we're going to start with Jill Bonenkamp. And I would just like to say that uh, in my role at the Rhode Island Department of Education that I have had the distinct um, pleasure of working with both Jill and Sandra. So we'll start with Jill. Dr. Jill Bonenkamp is an assistant professor and core faculty at the National Center for School Mental Health within the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Bonenkamp has extensive experience in school mental health, research, policy, and clinical practice at the local, state, and national levels. She works with individual school personnel, district, state, and national leaders to advance high quality school mental health and is the lead evaluator on the School Health Services National Quality Initiative. Dr. Bonenkamp is a licensed clinical psychologist and builds on multiple years of direct clinical experience as a school mental health clinician in urban, suburban, and rural school districts to inform her research and policy work. So without further ado, Dr. Jill Bonenkamp. Thank you so much, Rosemary, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I am thrilled to see, as Rosemary shared, the, the WISC model in action here today, and thank you all for joining as we talk about this very important topic of mental health in schools, supporting our youth, supporting our educators, supporting our families and our whole school community. As we know, we've had such an impact and that we've been talking about mental health and known that this is an important topic that we now know, know now more than ever. Um, so let me go ahead and pull up my slides and we'll get started. Can everyone see okay? All right, great. Thanks everyone. Well, I'm thrilled to be here with you today. And thank you for that nice introduction as well, Rosemary. So um, as Rosemary said, I'm with the National Center for School Mental Health, which is at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. We are funded in part by the Health Resources and Services Administration to lead the National Quality Initiative focused on comprehensive school mental health services. Our mission is to strengthen policies and programs in school mental health to improve learning and promote success for America's youth. And we do that by focusing on advancing school mental health research, training, policy, and practice at the local, state, and national federal levels. 
Um, we also operate as a community partnered school mental health program. Do we're saying your mic might be a little low, Jill. The folks are, might be having a little trouble trouble hearing you. All right, I'll speak up and get closer. Is that better? <laughs> that's, a little, that's a little bit better. Absolutely. Okay, wave at me again if it's if it's not loud enough. Thank you for the call out. Um, so in addition to uh, running our national center, we also operate as a community partnered school mental health organization and provide mental health supports to students uh, directly in several counties in Maryland, including Baltimore City. Uh, that keeps us very honest in this work. And so everything that we'll talk about today and that we develop and co-develop with stakeholders just like yourself are really embedded in our practice. Uh, our center is co-directed by Drs. Sharon Hoover and Nancy Lever, and um, I'm on the faculty and a clinical and school psychologist by training. And so as we're getting into our resources and into some of the tools that I'm going to talk about today, it's really important that we start and share that at, at the National Center, we're committed to conducting all of our work through a social justice lens. And we will continue our work to support culturally responsive and equitable practices in school mental health with a specific focus on Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And we recognize that through addressing structural and systemic inequities that have been long present in our education and mental health systems, that school mental health have opportunities to develop and model equitable and anti-racist policies and practices. And so I'll talk about how this commitment is embedded in each of the resources. All right, so what's on our agenda for today? At least for my section, there is more coming for you from um, uh, Sandy as well. So first, I'll briefly touch on this great need. And I'll be talking about our elevated rates and severity of youth mental health concerns, and especially as that's related to COVID impact. But more importantly, I'll be quick, quickly getting to how comprehensive school mental health systems can help, sharing some definitions about when we say comprehensive school mental health, what does that mean? And then getting right into free, everything I'll talk about today is 100% free, action-oriented school mental health resources. And I like to give this advanced organizer because I'll be going through a lot of resources. So um, several key ones that you'll hear about today are the SHAPE system, the National School Mental Health Curriculum, the mental health training intervention for health providers in schools, and then I'll touch on some of our other center resources. So I was thrilled to see so many folks already introducing themselves in the chat. If you hadn't, haven't already, please feel free to do so. We're thrilled to know where folks are coming from and your role. And um, please also feel free to share, in addition to questions, your biggest need for your team uh, as it relates to student, family, and educator, social, emotional, and mental health. And we're happy to um, answer questions about those, but also helps us as, as and guides our presentation to make sure we're addressing those. Um, and I absolutely reiterate, uh, Casey said to please ask questions in the chat. We really want this to be as helpful um, as possible. All right, so let's ground as to why we're here and why, you know, I, I know that I'm, I'm speaking to a group who is passionate and dedicated around supporting youth and making sure schools are safe and supported for them and making sure that that really that they are doing well. And, and we're in a tough spot right now for youth. So um, this is from a recent Washington Post article that came out and, and I just think it summarizes it well for us. That more than 10 months into the pandemic, mental health is a simmering crisis for many of the nation's school children partly hidden by isolation, but increasingly evident in the distress of parents, the worries of counselors, and an early body of research. And I can imagine that a number of folks 
on the call today are some of those worries of counselors and school health professionals and educators. And so I know that you know this information and I share this because it's critical for us to be telling everyone we can talk to about this mental health crisis. And more importantly, the things that we can do to help to get out in front of it and to help to make sure that these youth that we care so much about are able to get the help that they need. And I'll share some additional statistics here, stark statistics that I think, again, are important for us to be sharing with folks who are in leadership positions to be able to address this and think about this. And, and you know, I think these numbers speak for themselves. Um, this is staggering that 25% of US college and high school students know someone who has suicidal thoughts. Um, that half of high school students report moderate or extreme concerns about their mental health. When we think about a mental health, this, this is what we're seeing where ev almost every student, you know, one in two students. And, and we've seen these numbers play out um, in really tragic ways in school systems um, and in our, our, our places across the country as we see suicide rates that are increasing. And so I share this um, to encourage you to share this with others and um, to make this to continue to make this a priority in your work and we're grateful for you being here today and to frame as we're thinking about what these comprehensive school mental health supports look like and so i'll start by going into some definitions about that and so when we say comprehensive school mental health we mean a big umbrella so we mean a multi-tiered system of support mental health uh, promotion, early intervention, and mental health treatment. And we operate from this MTSS or public health framework with the following guiding principles that we think about education and mental health integration and collaboration. We see that on today's call. We think about implementation science and practice that cultural responsiveness and equity is embedded in every single thing that we do that we're thinking carefully about financing and sustainability, making sure we're advocating and having sound policy, and that youth and family are at the table in every discussion that we're having and, and, and in all of our work that we're doing. And so when we think about core features of comprehensive school mental health, we know that there is a significant group of school employed and community employed health, mental health and education and professionals at the table. And again, this image just reiterates some of the founding principles again. I couldn't give a presentation about comprehensive school mental health without at least one triangle. So again, just another image to show us, we're really thinking about targeted interventions for students with serious concerns, supports in early intervention, and making sure we're thinking about promotion of positive social and emotional behavioral skills for all students. And when we see those numbers, where 50% of students are saying they're moderately to severely concerned about their mental health, we know that this bottom part of the triangle is critical, um, that we're really thinking about this. And so as I'm sharing our, my resources um, of things to help with your comprehensive school mental health system, please know that we're thinking about all tiers of the triangle and really thinking about this multi-tiered system of support. We know that there is a lot of work to go around. And so this, uh, this image here shows more about uh, how we're thinking about partnering with community partners and school districts, uh, really in making sure we're, we're addressing this multi-tiered system. So we have questions that come up and say, well, how are we adapting this you know, due to COVID and how do we make this work uh, in an ever-changing education landscape? And I think it's really helpful to ground us that many of these practices and resources and evidence base that we have that were critical before COVID are even more critical now. 
And so we really encourage folks to continue to focus on those best practices and I'll share those that are included in our resources. And I'll share some of the adaptations that we've made as well as we're thinking about uh, implementing these in virtual or hybrid environments. Okay, so now to get to resources. All right, so the first one I wanna share with you is a brief resource. It is uh, guidance from the field and advancing comprehensive school mental health systems. If you are new to comprehensive school mental health and want a brief resource um, to really give you an overview or are looking for a document to share with others that gives an overview and a rundown, highly recommend that you check this out. We'll be putting, uh, of course, you'll be able to receive these slides and we'll put, be putting these links in the chat, but also at the end of my presentation, I have one slide that kind of has your six um, best links. And so don't feel like you need to sort of quickly get every link in there. Um, I, I'll be going through to more share these with you um, so you see them to begin with. All right, so um, a major resource that I want to share is the SHAPE system. Our NCSMH team is part of the National Quality Initiative and in partnership with many folks in the field, um, I'm sure probably folks on this call, um, developed the School Health Assessment and Performance Evaluation System or the SHAPE system for, for short. It's a free public access web-based platform that offers schools, districts, and states a workspace and targeted resources to support school mental health quality improvement. And I'll show you more about uh, what SHAPE looks like and how it works. So in SHAPE, schools and districts can map their school mental health services and supports. They can assess their school mental health system quality using national performance standards. They can receive custom reports and strategic planning guidance and resources, and then utilize additional shape features, including our screening and assessment library, and use district and state dashboards to collaborate with schools and districts in your region. And I'll be walking through what some of these resources look like. So one of the key ways folks can do this work is by completing the school mental health quality assessment on shape, using the SHAPE Resource Center, which houses free resources to help your team advance school mental health, and then being able to collaborate. And I'll show you what some of those state and district dashboards look like. So there's an options for folks to sign up as an individual, a school, a district, or a state. As I mentioned, it's completely free. SHAPE has been used by over 15,000 schools in, over, in all 50 states, and I encourage you to explore today. You can get started and sign up. You just answer a few questions, and you'll have access to see all these resources. So I'll give you a sneak peek of what this looks like if you sign up. This is an overview page, which is just your launching point for all of the features in SHAPE. A key feature here is a, the school mental health profile, which allows you to um, enter information in about your system staffing, services, and supports. With all of the assessments that you'll see in here, you'll receive customized reports, and I'll show you what those look like in just a moment. SHAPE houses the school, National School Mental Health Quality Assessment, and it allows comprehensive school mental health systems to do a comprehensive assessment of their, of their system based on seven domains, including teaming, needs assessment and resource mapping, screening, mental health promotion, services and supports, early intervention, treatment services supports, funding and sustainability and impact. And within each of the domains, there are additional indicators for folks to um, assess on. And there's really a focus on cultural considerations and equity throughout each of the domains. And I know you can't read through all of these quickly, but I just show you uh, these indicators to give you a sense of the scope. So this is a screenshot of what the quality assessment looks like if you're in shape and completing it as a school or district. Each question includes, includes a list of best practices. And um, we often talk about the utility of the school mental health quality assessment as assessment as intervention. And these best practices are embedded. So when you're completing this assessment, you can really already be thinking about 
what do we have in our system that's working well? What are places where we might think about improvement as we're looking at these best practices, getting ideas about things that we might consider for our system? After you complete the assessment, and, and the assessment is modularized, so folks can complete one domain at a time or the, or the entire assessment. After each domain or the entire report, you receive a report with your data back to you. This is a great resource to be able to share back with your team, with other folks who are interested and to really make the case for where your strengths are and where maybe areas for growth. The report also has a strategic planning guide um, that's a tool that teams can use to map out steps for their quality improvement work. SHAPE also houses a resource library, which is organized by the key components of comprehensive school mental health, and you can click by domain to organize and search resources. The Resource Center also contains the School Mental Health Quality Guide series, and there's a quality guide for each domain, and they can include background on the domain, best practices, action steps, examples from the field, um, and they're all in that Resource Center. And when you go into SHAPE, you know, we talk about using the quality assessment and then going into the Resource Center, but you have access to all of these. There's, there's no right or wrong way to use it. And we really recommend that you just get started with whichever way is best um, for your team. So this is one of the um, dashboards that we talked about. This is a district dashboard. And as you can see, um, districts are able to collaborate with their schools here. And we have similar dashboards at the state level where states can collaborate with their districts and schools. Uh, both in their quality assessment work and in other assessments that are in the SHAPE system. SHAPE also houses a screening and assessment library, which includes free and low cost measures um, to meet the needs of schools and districts. You can sort these um, by focus area, purpose, age, and language. SHAPE also houses the Trauma Responsive Schools Implementation Assessment, which is a quality improvement tool, which was developed by the NTCSN Treatment and Services Adapt Adaptation Center. Uh, and the TRSIA is an evidence-informed self-assessment that's focused on trauma-responsive services. All right, I'm at my five-minute warning, so I'm going to roll through a couple of these quickly so we can make sure we get to questions at the end. So this is the state school mental health profile on SHAPE. So the next resource I want to share with y'all is the National School Mental Health Curriculum. And um, the, the domains here in the National School Mental Health Curriculum align with the domains on the School Mental Health Quality Assessment. And this was developed to be delivered as a district training. There are teacher guides um, the, uh, and, and um, trainer guides and participant materials, but it also comes as a great compendium of resources. And so I will show you some of those. So this is what it looks like if you go into the curriculum. You can see it's organized by the team and quality indicators, but I'm most excited to show you some of these resources that are embedded in here. So for instance, for teaming, we have this team roles and functions, a components of MOUs for school and community partnerships. There are also discussion questions and district examples and options for discussion questions and strategic planning. And here are some additional examples of what it looks like for the tiers two and three modules, the value of mental health in schools and why mental health treatment in schools. And these are just great resources to think about, want to make sure that you're aware of all of these um, as things that you may use for you, your community, that you may be able to make the case for why this is critical. And here are some additional resources here in an intervention planning form. All of these resources do not come just from our center. We have compiled them from experts across the country, including uh, we're highlighting a number of the resources that, that Sandra will talk about in her presentation. And so quickly just showing you some examples of some of these um, resources that are in here. 
If you are interested in SHAPE and the national curriculum and are really interested in potentially engaging in this in an intensive way, uh, we'll be sending out the RFA. It is actually live today. I, I just got an email come through, so I'll throw it in the chat um, for our Comprehensive School Mental Health Systems Learning Collaborative. It's a state learning collaborative um, and it's multi-level. States have districts participating. Rosemary and her team participated from Rhode Island. Thank you, Rosemary, for giving two thumbs up. Um, so please feel free to follow up with me um, if you're interested in that for your state in a more intensive way for this next year. All right, and so the last resource that I'll focus on today is really geared. I saw we had lots of school nurses and lots of folks who are directly in the schools providing services. This tool is for you, the Mental Health Training Intervention for Health Providers in Schools. This came out of a partnership with the National Association of School Nurses and really this call for we need more mental health education. We need more resources directly for school health professionals to help us in our mental health work because we're on the front lines and we're doing this work and we want additional resources. And so this is um, a eight hour training that's broken into different uh, sections. I'll share some of the, the components of it. Um, this whole training is available online and for free and I'll show you how to access that in just a moment. Um, so the first module is foundation of practice. It helps you with common factors for addressing student mental health concerns, identification and assessment, crisis response and safety planning, and referral and resource map mapping. And this is just to get you, give you a sense of what uh, this looks like for identification and assessment looking at in the context of a health assessment, how might we be able to parse about mental health concerns, how can school health providers be part of the uh, team in, re in responding to school crises. We know that you're often pulled into these or leading these. Got my one minute morning. Thank you. We're perfect. We're great. Um, and so, uh, you know, critical skills here. And so just to give you a sense of some of the other things that are included in here, training in mental health treatment basics, cognitive behavioral therapy basics, with uh, worksheets that are specifically geared for you to pull uh, out of the file and be able to use directly with students. Just a couple of examples here and some examples of the additional things that are included. And I'll skip quickly to um, a really critical feedback we got was the want and desire for there to be information about pediatric pharmacology. And so we have that on there um, and additional resources. And as I mentioned, this entire course is available online with implementation training videos, video vignettes. So you can actually see a clinician practicing these skills in sessions with you. Our center has a number of other resources, and so I recommend that you check us out at schoolmentalhealth.org. We have a coronavirus page. We also have a page specifically devoted to cultural responsiveness and equity. We update all of these frequently. And, um, and as I promised, here is the slide. If you're going to, I know when I'm in a webinar, I take a screenshot of things throughout. So this is a key one too, if you want to get all of those links. And of course, we'll have them at the end. Um, and so thanks for going through this whirlwind with me of some of these resources that we have available. And I'm thrilled now to be able to get um, to questions. Thank you, Jill, for all that wonderful information. We'll get to right here to the questions and I'm gonna leave up that wonderful screen because I know that that's the one that folks uh, want the most. So I have a, um, some ones from maybe further back. So since your screen is up, we, I don't know, we may toggle back, but um, sure. before we get to that one, there was one question Ramona D asked um, about any suicide prevention or engagement activities for virtual learners. Yep, that's a great question. Um, let me think about specific programs. I will, as, as Sandra is presenting, I'm gonna throw some of those in the chat. I don't have any that I can rattle off at the top of my head, but I will pull some for you. 
Okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. And the quick shout out to our partners from Erica's Lighthouse. I saw Il uh, Ilana and Christina are here as well. Um, so I just want to shout them out just because I saw their names pop up uh, earlier. Um, Ann L asked uh, or stated and asked, school counselors, psychologists, and nurses are not mandated in schools and some are facing being laid off. What advice can you provide to those who are left at school to help students who will need mental health support? Who else can be tapped into to help? Yep. So, well, I, it's a whole nother story to talk about advocacy to make sure those key positions stay. Um, but anyone can say this. And when we say mental health, for all, that any educator, and, and I say educator meaning broadly, any person in that school building um, can participate in this work. And, and um, our, our team here, this panelist team had a conversation about this, that we want you know, these skills, this MH tips was developed for school health professionals. Those skills are applicable for other folks in the building too. And there are numerous resources, mental health training for educators. I will throw additional resources for that in the chat as well, because um, there are numerous resources for, for, for our teachers, for, you know, for our bus drivers. And I know Sandra will be speaking to that as well, but, but mental health for all, we need not just our, you know, our, our, we need everyone to be thinking about it. So it's a great call out. Awesome, thank you. I guess for the deep dive of more resources, we'll take it. Um, Teresa S. asked, in reference to your stat slide, so this was earlier in the presentation, um, the one that um, you were talking about, you know, that everybody knows something, you know, know someone and the numbers are staggering. How do, you, how do these current statistics compare to pre-COVID for the same statements? What are the differences there? Yep. So this report specifically came out of surveying youth um, during, you know, during COVID. And so they actually don't have pre-numbers, but we know that, that these numbers are much, much higher. If we compare them to other studies, um, they're, you know, much higher. And especially that, you know, 50% are reporting a moderate um, to severe concern about mental health. So our, our um, typical numbers that we, we cite are that um, about one in five youth would experience a, a diagnosed mental health uh, concern in a year. Um, and, and of course that poll is not speaking to a diagnosed mental health concern, but still that, you know, it, it's a much higher rate. Awesome, thank you. I'll ask one more just to keep us on time, but know that if your question didn't get asked, we have time at the end. Like I said at the beginning, we have time at the end dedicated for the questions we might not get to so we can move forward to Sandy's presentation. So one more for you. Um, how, what can we um, do to get buy-in from superintendents or administrators for this type of work? It's a great question. And so, you know, those two slides in the beginning are, are just that type of thing that this is not a sub sample of youth. This is every other youth that walks through your door. And so how can you, how can you not, how can you not address it? And, um, you know, we talk about it as a barrier of learning. And so I, you know, that, that type of data I know speaks to administrators that I know and, 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 and they speak in numbers and, and, and outcomes, right? So this is getting in the way of academic outcomes, but, but uh, many you know, folks have different you know, languages. And so I really encourage you to think about what is the key piece for your school community? You know, what is, is the focus of the superintendent or of the principal and how do you phrase it in that way? And, and, Lots of resources in that National School Mental Health Curriculum around the value and around statistics. Um, and our National Center has a lot of that. So if you need more, please go there. Please feel free to reach out to us. Jill, thank you so much for amazing. I'm so glad you're sticking around because we got some more questions and I can't wait to ask you those. I'm, I'm just, I've been excited about this since we planned <laughs> it and, some pre and preparing for it. And I'm still just as excited even though it's already happened. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I will now pass it back to Rosemary to introduce our next speaker. Wonderful. So I um, am currently working with uh, Sandra Williamson, who is a uh, vice president at the American Institutes for Research in Washington, DC. 
She has worked in the field of education for 41 years. Her work is focused on special education, developing social, emotional, multi-tiered supports in schools, accessing mental health services and community-based programs, school-based mental health services, positive behavioral supports, and school discipline. She leads several technical assistance projects for improving school-based services for children and youth with social, emotional, and behavioral needs. She is the director for the National Center on Safe and Supportive Learning Environments funded by the US Department of Education, which provides support for measuring and implementing programs that address school safety and school climate. Please, Sandra. Thank you, Rosemary, and I hope folks can hear me. Just a thumbs up if you can. Okay. Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome everyone this afternoon. So first of all, I have to say, I'm so excited to see that 60% of our attendees this afternoon are school nurses. Um, Casey is smiling and so is Rosemary because I had this discussion with them earlier in the week. Um, there was a report done about, I think, five to seven years ago of mental health services being delivered in the United States. And it looked at all the different locations that children and youth were receiving mental health supports. And it listed out by role who were the providers. And the number one provider of mental health supports in schools were school nurses. And I have seen repeatedly over the years, I would be doing presentations at national meetings or conventions, and there would be a 1,000 people in a room. And I would say, how many school nurses are in the room? Raise your hand. And there'd be like one or two folks that would kind of raise their hands. And I was saying, okay, educators, look around. You need to start bringing a school nurse with you <laughs> to these sessions because it's going to be critical. If they're the frontline people, that our young people are going to when they're just feeling out of sorts, you know, we need to include them. So really glad to see so many of you on the call today. <clears throat> so I, I want to start with just a couple of overarching uh, comments about the context that we're talking about today. And then I'm going to drill pretty quickly down into um, some very specific resources and tools, just like Jill did, that are available um, from the center. Um, so first of all, just understanding this context. So if you look at these three circles, um, we've got those existing stressors on youth and families. We've got this local and national context and events, certainly the unprecedented combination of the pandemic combined with the social justice issues that we have had. Um, it's a very unique time in our country. Uh, what we also need to recognize is there has never been the combination of these factors where we were able to evaluate the best practices and the best interventions for our young people. So we really don't have a strong empirical base for what we would suggest in strategies other than just knowing what has proven true over decades within schools and how to support young people and how to support families, and especially when they are faced with these stressors. Uh, so we really need to focus, and I'll be talking some about what are some of those risk and protective factors that are involved in supporting our young people. These are some of the stressors that have been identified that are specifically related to COVID. Uh, increased challenges with mental health, uh, confusion and uncertainty about what's going to happen next. I heard on the radio yesterday, somebody was saying, do you remember when we heard on March 11th that we were going to shut down for two weeks, two weeks, <laughs> while we got everything under control? And they said it's now almost a year later, and it just seems so unreal to even remember those conversations and what was being said. There's been worry and fear for the safety of ourselves, for each other, for teachers, for students themselves, and tons of anxiety related to the unknowns, and not just on behalf of our young people, but all of us as adults, right, who have new responsibilities, new caretaking responsibilities, and balance issues. We also have uh, these fears that are associated with reopening and COVID transmissions, 
and very different opinions and evidence about that. And then these unsafe situations sometimes, not always, but at home. There can be abuse, there can be neglect, and there can be domestic violence. It has always been a factor in our country, but now there are not as many adults in a young person's environment that are seeing them on a daily basis to recognize signs or symptoms that something could be going on. <clears throat> there are also stressors related to loss. Um, we all know what happens when there's the loss of a loved one or a death in the family and the kinds of supports that young people or adults needed with one single solo incident. And now you have communities and schools as communities where they have multiple losses. Uh, we have students and staff who are missing out on important rituals. I mean, we know in the spring, how many stories did we hear of young people? I didn't get to go to my prom. I didn't get to go to my graduation. We didn't get to say goodbye. We, all, we saw all sorts of creative practices. School, bu school bus drivers were actually driving their routes, their school bus routes, opening their doors and waving goodbye at children for the summer just so that they could feel connected and bring some closure to the school year. We also know the other loss was this sudden disruption of normal routines and relationships and structure and even predictability. And unfortunately, what we've seen more of is this has uh, gone on for longer periods of time is this insecurity related to food uh, and shelter and housing. As many families have lost homes, they've had to move in with other family members. There's also been many stressors related to equity, uh, the disproportional effects of COVID in communities of color and increased risk for <clears throat> those and other stressors, this disproportionate access to virtual education for students. Uh, we've seen some very creative solutions over the last few months, so it's over the, especially in the fall, where they've increased access to Wi-Fi and to broadband. Uh, and so young people could access education. However, staggering figure, there's about one-fourth of the young people in our country that are unaccounted for, <laughs> meaning a year ago they were on school rosters, they were part of attendance structures, and since the pandemic, since everybody was sent home, they have not resurfaced. So we're going to have a major concern when we do reopen, fully reopen schools in person, um, that we're going to have to account for many of our young people and, and where are they. Um, and then this uh, having to learn new technology, and I'll count myself among that. I was sharing with the panel. Nobody lets me control anything because it could be a problem, but today in the technology worked. So really balancing all of that. So what are some of the national trends that we're seeing? I think Jill provided some of those to you. I will just repeat a few of them. 76% of students and 66% of teachers are lower in spirits than they were before the crisis. We've got 21, and that's been now as high as 25% of students are absent during the closures. They're not logging in. They're not making contact. They're dropping out of class, or they haven't surfaced. And nearly 33% of students in communities of poverty are not participating in online classes. Past pandemics were associated with increased depression, anxiety, stigma, shaming, and we anticipate this is going to go on even after we do return to actually school buildings. And then that longitudinal impact, the negative ones, and other large-scale community crises uh, we fully anticipate are going to be happening again. Here is just some feedback. We did a, a webinar in the summer of 2020, and we asked a um, couple, over a thousand people, um, educators, what their major concerns were related to students. And as you can see in this particular um, cloud, um, number one concern was student learning, the second was student engagement, but student safety and their physical and mental health were right up there. Uh, folks were absolutely concerned about this. And perhaps, and I, this is a very important quote, I think we all know exactly what, what was being said here. This one is from SAMHSA, uh, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration out of HHS. 
perhaps the most potent element of all in, <clears throat> in an effective crisis service system is relationships, to be human and to be compassionate. And we know from experience that immediate access to help, access to hope, and access to healing is going to save lives. And many of you have been part of pretty comprehensive efforts to rally whatever resources you could as students were at home to provide exactly that, help, hope, and healing uh, over this period of time where we've been out. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit now about the National Center on Safe Supportive Learning Environments, but I, I do want to pause and just talk for a couple of minutes about this mission because I think it will help to understand where the basis of this work comes from. The mission of the center is to improve conditions for learning in schools and to sustain safe and engaging and healthy school environments uh, that support student academic success. Let's back down from that for a second. Let's, let's think about that and take it apart a little bit. So improve the conditions for learning. Safe, engaging, and healthy environments. And folks, this just isn't for students. This is for the people who work in those environments. This is for the people who show up every morning and are there to work with young people and work with other adults and to make those environments environments that we would want to spend six, seven, or eight hours a day in. And, and that's what we're really talking about. We need to face a couple of, of realities. We cannot stop or pause to ask everyone who works in schools and has been working there for maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or two years, or one year, what do you believe about the school's role related to mental health? Do you think it's your job to be concerned about your students' mental health? If we'd asked that question a year ago, year and a half ago, two years ago, the answers we usually get are, I didn't sign up to be a mental health counselor. I didn't sign up to be a mental health provider. I teach reading. I teach math. I teach third graders, you know, how, how to read and write and to think strategically, analytically, right? But what we know is that teachers, school nurses, school support staff have been put in a position where on a daily basis they are the de facto mental health providers within the systems. And so really taking a pause, and we, we haven't had time to do that, uh, about what is the school's role. We all had to literally react almost overnight to this pandemic and to jumping into a very different role. Uh, the tri triangle that Jill put up earlier, it's one we're all very familiar with. You know, 80% uh, 80, uh, 80 of young people within a school environment, you know, need Tier 1. Another 15% need Tier 2 of targeted interventions. 5 to 7% need Tier 3 pretty intensive interventions. And I would say to you that that tri triangle has been tipped on its head, literally, that 85 to 90% of young people in schools are going to need some pretty intensive supports, and we're going to have to structure the environments in order to do that. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to reiterate that, that most folks go into this frame where they're saying, not my job, it's your job, right? And in this scenario, it's all of our jobs. <clears throat> so... Within the National Center, we've been in existence for a decade. So for the last 10 years, we have provided uh, 53 grantee support over the last decade. We currently um, are providing uh, support to Project Prevent, uh, the mental health professionals, trauma recovery, and school-based mental health grantees. And I won't go into all the details uh, for those particular programs today other than to say there's plenty of information about those on our website. Um, we have supported uh, addressing the emerging issues in schools related to safe environments. We also helped develop the National School Climate Survey and then all of the resources and tools that back up how to implement strategies, interventions, and programs. This is our website, and we would encourage everyone to, to take a visit. Uh, it's Fairly easy to remember, safe 
safesupportivelearning.ed.gov. So safesupportivelearning.ed.gov. So what I'm going to do is a quick tour today of this variety of guides and training products because we have a bunch. And Jill, I think, labeled her slide free. I should have put free in front of these, but it is, it is the case. Everything you see that I'm going to share today is free. It is downloadable. Um, and even more so, it is in, a lot of them are interactive, and I will share that as well. These were developed with federal funds and are totally available. And we many times get emails that say, can we use it or can we customize it? Can we customize that resource? And the answer is absolutely yes. All we ask is that you give attribution to where you got the core elements of whatever you're doing to customize and that you show the original uh, publication. So there are four training products I'm going to show you pretty quickly. Our trauma-sensitive schools training package, uh, our creating a safe and respectful environment in our nation's classrooms, creating a safe and respectful environment on our nation's school buses, and get smart, get help, and get safe. And then there are five guides and toolkits that I want to highlight. One is on human trafficking in America's schools. One is on school climate improvement resource package. The third is on a safe place to learn, prevent, intercede, and respond to sexual harassment of K-12 students. The fourth is addressing the root cause of discipline and school discipline disparities. And then the last is safe place, trauma-sensitive practices for health centers striving for uh, serving higher ed students. And the reason I'm throwing that one in is because a lot of the practices and interventions and scripts for how to interact uh, are very uh, usable for high school students, and I thought there would be quite a few of you that work with high school students on the call today. So this is the first one I want to highlight. Um, this is our training sensitive uh, schools training package uh, on trauma. And there are four distinct sections of this training package. There's an implementation guide. There's understanding trauma and its impact, building trauma sensitive schools. And the fourth, and I saw a note earlier, how do we engage principals and superintendents um, that, this is a particular part of the training package geared towards school leadership that really helps frame it for school leaders, uh, even school boards. Uh, we think this, this material has been very useful for. Um, I would share with you that this one has been uh, downloaded thousands of times. Um, it has been used frequently uh, throughout districts, and the second part of this, understanding trauma and its impact, is a great standalone training piece if you just want to make people aware of what we can all do uh, to understand trauma and its potential impact. <clears throat> the second is creating safe and respectful environment in our nation's classrooms. This is a two-module packet that we developed with NEA and AFT. And we're very, you know, we're very pleased over the last few years since uh, we put it out there that it's been also downloaded thousands of times and used for training. Um, and let me just put a disclaimer in here. Um, the National Center does not collect any data on the who. We don't know who uses it. We only know the numbers. And on our national school uh, surveys, the climate surveys, you can download those onto virtual machines and can administer them in school districts, and we never see that data. It is never rolled back up to the national office. So this is what the materials just look at or look like at a glance. Trainer's guides, overviews, outlines, PowerPoint slides are already there. The handouts are already there in PDF format. There's also a self-study training aspect to this, so self-study workbooks. These can all be done online, virtually, synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, and so we, we find that folks are saying that the, this has been extremely useful, especially given the virtual environment that we've all been in over the last year. I wanted to include this one. Um, this is uh, creating a safe and respectful environment in our nation's school buses. 
And the first is about when you see something and there's bullying happening, how to intervene safely. And the second, though, is how to create a supportive environment on bus, on our buses, on our nation's buses. Um, I just want to say this is very adaptable materials for anyone, uh, any particular group within a school that interacts with young people. Um, I want to draw your attention to the gray and white card that's on the right. Um, this is something that shows how you adapt. School bus drivers call these visor cards. And what this is is they print them and they clip it to the visor above their heads on the school bus. And this is their little reminders of stopping bullying, seeing something and doing something, and these were visor cards that actually got put up. Now, would we have ever known to develop visor cards? No. But because we developed all of this training material with the National Association for Student Transportation, the bus drivers told us, <laughs> we don't have time to carry around a notebook. We can't carry around a notepad. We're driving. And so they, we said, well, what would be a good reminder? And they said, oh, a visor card. Little did we know. I am sure there's the equivalent to that to any group of personnel that works in your schools or in your community agencies uh, that you might be able to think about. Uh, and I, let me go back for one second because I, I shared this with the planning group earlier. Um, we did this training um, in one of the states a couple of years ago, and they asked us to repeat the training, but to do it for their cafeteria staff. And they disclosed to us that uh, the only issue was their cafeteria staff, their literacy level uh, may not be what these products and resources were written at uh, the literacy level. And we decided that the best solution was to videotape this training. And so it's just one aspect of how to make those adaptations when needed. And they actually recorded it and put it on CDs back when people had CDs. Now you could do it, you could stream it, uh, and made it accessible to all providers within the district. And it was, uh, the uptake was much more, uh, done much more quickly that way. Our Get Smart, Get Help, and Get Safe I included this one because it's really about specialized instructional support personnel, school psychologists, school social workers, school nurses, yay, um, <laughs> and guidance counselors, and how you identify, assess, and effectively intervene with preventing teenage dating abuse, teenage violence. But what we're finding is it's not just about teenage dating, it's about violence in general in this age group of kind of upper middle school and high school and working with teens. And there's a trainer's guide, PowerPoint, and handouts for this one as well. And <clears throat> I thought you guys would find it also helpful information. This uh, next one, Toolkits and Guides, is on human trafficking. And if you don't know about human trafficking in the United States, um, I would encourage you to take a look at this guide. Um, it has uh, just been revised. The date is January 2021 publication, so it is hot off the press. Um, what this guide includes is how to prevent and respond and to help students recover from human trafficking. And it really uh, is awakening, eye-opening, in terms of the prevalence, especially in some of our communities across this country, and the pandemic has only exacerbated this in many areas. Once again, because young people are not in settings where multiple adults are seeing them or able to assess their risk factors. And this particular toolkit, this next one, is School Climate Improvement Resource Package. And let me just, I could talk for about half a day on this, but I won't. Um, this is our accompanying to the National School Climate Survey, but you don't have to do a survey to use this guide. Folks, there are 6,000 pages on the website that back up all of the um, strategies, supports, interventions, and practical advice about how to support school climate in a positive way within school districts. And so I would encourage you to um, just take a, a cruise um, through these materials. 
These are all the different components of the resource package. And uh, once again, a lot of really good uptake of these resources. The package itself uses this uh, five uh, sections of the wheel, uh, planning, engaging, collecting and reporting, choosing and implementing interventions, and then monitoring and evaluating those interventions in that implementation cycle. This is uh, another one of our toolkits, Safe Place to Learn. Uh, this is to prevent and eliminate peer-to-peer -peer sexual harassment and sexual violence. And there's an implementation guide, there's uh, e-learning, staff e-learning modules, there's a coordinated response team planning guide, and handouts and worksheets. The coordinated response team planning guide is an excellent template, if I could redo it, for pandemic planning. <laughs> like the, the kinds of questions you ask yourselves as a team, the kind of response that you have in place, and the kinds of interventions that you first lead with, so first you do no harm. So uh, just hope people will find that one useful as well. And this one is addressing the root causes of disparities in school discipline. Uh, school discipline has not been as much a topic for people since we've all been e-learning or in hybrid models for the last year. In fact, we've had a lot of requests for how do you handle school discipline at the uh, cyberbullying and uh, along the way. And um, this particular root cause analysis has been helpful if your school system has some issues with disproportional rates of uh, kids who are being disciplined or excluded from school and doing that analysis and some steps to take to develop plans to correct that. Um, and then I think this is my last one, Safe Place for Higher Ed, and the reason I put it in, as I said, uh, this one is to support health center staff, uh, understanding the likelihood of trauma and what uh, students may experience through trauma, how to infuse trauma-sensitive approaches in your daily routines, and then creating a caring environment uh, for those affected by trauma. And I think it might be useful as well, considering it was written for the health uh, center staff from that perspective who also helped us develop that. And, ta-da, that's it. <laughs> How'd I do, Casey? <laughs> you did great. I was just I was telling to the um, panel, I was like, I was so caught up in all these wonderful resources, I lost track of time. So yeah, if you go ahead and stop your screen share, Sandy, we will get into your questions. You're awesome. And you've got through all those amazing slides. Um, please, um, type your questions in. I'm going to go ahead and um, begin with, with a question uh, that was already in the chat, but other questions, please get those in. I will capture those. Um, Sandy, Evelyn and M, excuse me, um, was asking about were those percentages of students, of all students, or just high school students referencing that slide you had earlier on? That was all students. Yes. A lot of the federal agencies have been doing what they're calling pulse surveys. They're doing very frequent outreach to large groups, large populations to assess tracking trend data over a period of time while we've been out. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it wasn't, if I'm remembering correctly, it wasn't the really young ones, but it was like grades maybe four or five through 12, if I'm remembering. But um, I can double check that, Casey, and we can okay. make sure it's there we share. Very good. Um, the, uh, just a general, these have come up a couple of times and one just popped in. Um, Asha will post these slides in a couple of days on our website. You'll have access to these things, to, to all this wonderful information and these links to the resources. And our thanks to Sharon Murray, Murray, one of our past presidents who's been popping in those links throughout. If you want to scroll back and capture some now, and you, don't want to, you don't want to wait a couple of days. She's been popping those in um, throughout the presentation so you can scroll up through everything. A question um, that, I mean, it could really go for either you or Jill, but I'll, I'll address it to you first, please, Sandy, is really asking in, when looking at all of this, everything that we're going through right now, and lot, losing track of students, right? That was something that was mentioned as well. Losing track of students and having to come back in and track students. 
What about those ones who are graduating from high school? What are some of the things that we should, conversations we should be having right now to put some things in place too, if it's going to be that they have to do, you know, summer school to, to, you know, be able to transition and graduate and still graduate if they want to go into the workforce that requires, a, you know, a diploma or go into higher ed. Like, what are some of those things that that mental health support, right? And then that that transition support as well um, that we need conversations we should be having about that right now. So, Jill, if you want to go first, I'm happy to add. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So uh, a couple things. One is if you go back, if you remember the slide I showed of the young man sitting at a desk and SAMHSA's quote about the most important thing we can do is give hope, healing, health, right, and the personal relationship side of this, I think we've seen throughout the country many communities have got very creative about support systems, networks, what we would call communities of practice or communities of learning or peer-to-peer -peer kind of support where school districts have convened these subgroups of their seniors, right, to, to, to replace what would be happening with all that planning and mm -hmm. counselors and all of that piece to hold these kind of virtual communities that are topical for seniors to be thinking about their experience this year. And, you know, I, I mean, I must hear it every third day on my, my conversations at work. The parents who st have students who are seniors who are doing final decisions around what college they're going to go to. And parents saying, I don't even know if I want to send them to college if we're going to have another year, right, of them being at home. And so uh, really that kind of support. Equally, some families, a family peer-to-peer -peer support for families who have seniors and the way to do that. And, and let's keep in mind, Casey, this isn't just schools having this responsibility. So this is the whole community and really what pieces are owned. Um, sometimes people ask, you know, uh, Sandy, if, you know, if we had a dollar, where would you invest it? Like, where would you spend that dollar? And I would say I'd spend it getting together with all the other agencies in my community to meet on a regular basis to talk about how to uphold support kids and young people and families. So really how to wrap around our kids and our families. And, th and that's an example that we've been hearing are these peer-to-peer -peer networking virtual opportunities. Absolutely. Jill, before I move to the next one, did you have anything to add or we can go to the... Yeah, no, I mean, I think I would echo that those tenants that Sandy just talked about are our key tenants of resiliency, of, you know, supporting one another, making sure kids are heard and that they have hope and that it, it takes our whole community to do that. We'll come back to that. So hang on to that thought and talk because that was one of our other questions, but I want to get to another one specifically for Sandy. Uh, Kaloud, I hope I pronounced that cor correctly, Kaloud T asks, are the kids translated to another language, for example, Arabic? Are, do we have other languages translations? So currently our National School Climate Surveys and all of the online administration uh, plus many aspects of the school climate implementation package are in Spanish and English. They are not in multiple languages. And I would just say due to resources, the available resources to develop these. However, we, we do make sure everything is 508 compliant and there are transcripts for most things that can be run through a translation software that allows folks. So we're happy to work with districts that have specific community needs to give them, and there's a word for it, and I'm not a techie, but it's basically to give them the code files for this, this, uh, these products, and that gives them the ability to go in on the back end and to convert those and to transcribe them and to translate them. So. I don't know. That may make sense to people who are more techie than I am, but I know it's possible. <laughs> that makes absolutely The fact that you said those last words, I know it's possible. That that right there is that we'll take that and run with that in some way that it can be trans translated um, for those populations that that need that and have differences than the two that we have available. It's awesome. Question from Roberto T. What are the main challenges to put these strategies into practice in the schools? 
So I'll start, and then, Jill, I want you to chime in. Um, as I started in the beginning, the main challenge is people don't necessarily believe that it's their job. <laughs> and that's not a bad – I mean, it's not like we need to blame or be critical of people. They were not trained. They never were – there was not this uniform disclaimer they signed when they signed up to be a teacher or a guidance counselor, right, that they were going to do these eight other things that were related to mental health. And so many times it's that they just don't know what to do. And that's what we usually hear is that I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to help. And so whenever we're challenged by a situation and we don't know what to do, we revert back to what we do know and what we do well, right? And so that's been the major, I think, kind of roadblock. I just want to put a plug in. We have, we must have 100 to 200 webinars that are archived on our website. And a series of those webinars are called Making the Case for School Climate. And it's all of the research and evidence in a PowerPoint and in a manual that help folks convince school committees and school communities and teaching staff that it's, it's our job. This is all part of our job and that we can embed it. And the language, Casey, is important too. I, you know, and, and Jill and I, we've known each other a long time, and our two centers have worked together for a very long time. Their center is the Center for Mental Health. Our center is the center for, you know, basically school climate. Many times people will not pay as much attention to things that have a mental health label on them. <laughs> they will listen, though, if we connect it to the language, and I think the reference was made earlier when Jill was saying, you know, when, when you look at what are the superintendent's goals, that's where we come from. Get, the, get a copy of the strategic plan for the school district. Go through that strategic plan with a big old yellow highlighter, right? And, and circle and highlight everywhere in that strategic plan where there's a goal and an objective that somehow you can tie social-emotional learning and mental health supports and the, the research that shows you get better outcomes in those areas that are in that school district plan and turn that around into the language you use to talk and communicate with them about it. Jill? That's fantastic. Yes, I was just about to say thank you, Sandy, for passing it to Jill. Please share more. I'm doing a strong head agree nod yes with that 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 speaking the language and and use these resources that we have right you don't have to develop that this resource that Sandy's talked about is excellent um, there are you know a number of things that we have in the in the national curriculum around that and yeah I mean I think when we say mental health folks don't always know what that means when we say trauma responsive. And so I, and this is in Sandy's curriculum, there are lots of great supports, but just as we're having these conversations, when we say trauma responsive, this means that, um, you know, this, this means that we're thinking about relationships, we're thinking about routines, and we're thinking about ways to help students cope. And I think those things seem less scary, right? Like on a very personal level, like, anyone can do that relationships and routines. And so I think some of that breaking down some of our mental health language to, this is about when we see, when you know, I, uh, uh, I live in DC and they have, um, have adapted Sandy's great work and they have non-negotiables for their, their, their classrooms that every student is greeted when they, they, meet, they come in at the beginning of any school day and the beginning of any, any class, right? That's, that's mental health promotion in action. And but that, and that seems a lot less scary and intimidating. And that's something that every single person in the building can do. I love that. And thank you, Roberto, for that question all the way from Brazil, not making us feel bad at all, the beautiful weather that I'm sure Roberto is, is over there having. So <laughs> um, one final question before we move to our closing statements. 
um, because this is one that we started this day talking about the representation of all the folks from the WISP model, right? This is what we want. Everyone from the, all those different components coming together, having those conversations from the perspectives, thinking about the, the bus driver with the visor card, videoing things for folks with language and literacy barriers, but there's still components and they have and play a role in the success and children and you know, students in the schools being able to learn and thrive, right? So here's a question on parents. Parent participation is likely a challenge. Mina X asked this. Um, how can you get them to be major participants? What can we do through the school? Um, because home is a place where you know kids are incubated in fear and self-rejection and 70% of caretakers have some sort of mental health you know, diagnosis of some categories themselves. So what does that look like? How, where, where, where do we go from there? And that's, I know that's a, a lot to take in in one minute, but one minute response, 30 seconds response each. <laughs> Jill first, you go. Yeah, I'm happy to say so. We talk about comprehensive school mental health. We talk about family, school, community partnership. And there's a reason we start intentionally with families that we need to start with them, right? That, that every single thing that we do, anything that we want to incorporate, we need to start there. So at the very beginning of a process, we need to think about how do we start to engage with, with families and, and thinking, very flexibly about that, right? So we have some ways that we think we reach some families, but how do we really think about, and especially with, with COVID, knowing that families are so stressed, how do we think flexibly about when can we reach families? How can we best reach families? And starting you know, with some families that we can reach, but being really intentional about making sure that we're being inclusive in that. And I think that's, I think that's where we've run into problems is when we're not flexible and inclusive in that and then it and then we design programs that don't meet those needs and then it's harder for folks to engage so really at the very very beginning asking families what are the needs what do you feel like you want and just like we talked about making that mental health language more inclusive right mental health can sound scary and stigmatizing when we say things like this is about relationships this is about routines that can can be more inviting and I'll add very quickly, I was going to just say, ask them, ask families, but I, I, Jill did a great job. I would add an adjunct to that, uh, youth. Ask the young people themselves. Ask them. They are your best communicators and communication plan uh, work groups. So ask the young people as well. And I know Jill and our center both have great resources on families and youth engagement. So uh, happy to share those as well. Thank you so much for that. And I thank you for that to ask them and especially ask the youth. I'm a, I'm a youth voice advocate, so I appreciate that. And so um, we could go at it all day, y'all, but we are at the time and we're at it. And so thank you all for sticking around for so many of you sticking around. Wanted to make sure that you knew about continuing education opportunities and what that looks like and to make sure that you complete the um, webinar evaluation so that you can obtain your, your CE information. Um, and if you have questions, be on this, um, know that you can reach out to us anytime. Our website is here. Caitlin has put in the chat the link to the evaluation, um, so you can go ahead and get started on that. Um, but it also come out to you in your email. If you have questions, please reach out to us. Please contact us. Um, and Jeannie, please share with us our next, what's next for us? We are releasing our webinar series for 2021, so please, uh, Take a look at our website, ashaweb.org, and uh, take a look at what's available uh, the, in the coming year. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Jill and Sandy. You're amazing. Rosemary, you rock. I, I will forever be your cheerleader um, for just like truly getting this one. Sharon Murray, I know you have your camera off, but I want to thank you as well, my dear. And thank there's you. more to come. Be on the lookout for part two. Just the beginning. I love it. Just so exciting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.